Hello everyone, good morning. It's so lovely to be here today. Welcome to the FSB National Webinar on Generating Opportunities. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, just when you thought you'd experienced enough Royal Splendour this weekend, and what a spectacular weekend it was, we have a two for one treat for you today, which I'm just so excited about. As you all know, the world of sales can be temperamental. So today's session will be a whistle stop tour on how you can increase sales and also your chances of winning a tender submission. I am your host today. My name is Simona Daniel and I'm the Regional Development Manager in the East of England and the South East. I'll be shortly handing over to our speaker, Jason Roberts, who is the owner and founder of Collider International. Jason will be delivering a short presentation um, and at the end, um, you, there will be a chance for you to also submit a few of your questions, um, which Jason will answer. Um, we will do that around 10 to 15 minutes at the end. Please, please do use the questions to panellist button to send over your questions. Um, we will endeavour to answer as many as possible. Today's session will be recorded and shortly available on our on-demand page on the FSB website in case you would like to watch it again. And also, please do feel free to share the links with your colleagues as well. If you aren't yet an FSB member, we'd also love to have the opportunity to speak to you further about the benefits of joining. Um, so please, please do have a look at our website, www.fsb.org.uk, to book a meeting with a membership advisor. So now, without further ado, I will hand you over to our speaker for today, Jason Roberts. Well, Simona, good morning. Thank you so much for the invitation being here today. And to all those who are online as well, welcome. And I look forward to answering any questions that you have uh, later on during the presentation. Now, I'm about to share my screen and really just talk you through around a bit about an introduction about myself, first of all, and then also take you into understanding a bit about how to generate uh, new opportunities um, for your organizations. Now, first of all, uh, just a bit of an agenda um, review. We'll be going through a brief introduction of myself. We'll talk about some of the fundamentals around sales, and then also really to understand what it is to conduct a consultative discovery before moving on to the whole process around how to actually be effective with your sales process. So I'm Jason Roberts, the founder of Collider International, and I spent 24 years within financial services. That was 11 years working within investment banks, mostly within technology, and then about 13 years as the head of account management and also head of sales roles as well. Now, I was fortunate enough to be able to close several millions in uh, pounds worth of deals across the UK and Europe, but also importantly, retained and upsold existing accounts as well to the tune of several million dollars and pounds. Um, now, as a CEO of Collider International, what's important here for me was to find a process and leverage all the experience I had from 13 years in sales in learning how to build a brand, access a new market, access new sectors, and ultimately create a brand new lane for, uh, for the business itself. Now, very important for you to understand the reason why I'm, I decided or well, opted and requested to uh, share some of my experience and knowledge with you all today. The main objective when we look at sales is we all know sales is very difficult. It's a very um, demanding position to be in. And I want you guys to all earn more, live better and be happy. Now, it seems very, uh, you know, very, 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 very standard and normal. But we know that the sales process for most businesses is very, very difficult. For the most part, people who start businesses tend to be product experts. They're very good at knowing how to deliver their job. But when it comes to sales and delivering a sales process and delivering a sales demonstration, they can sometimes struggle with that part of their business. And that's why a lot of times businesses fail because they fail to generate uh, enough traction and interest in their organizations. So first of all, in order for us to begin, we have to understand what our sales target is. So think about it for yourselves. When you guys started this year or your financial year, how many of you actually had a sales target? A very interesting question. So what's the reason for having a sales target? Why is it important? And, uh, and how does it work? So typically, if we had a sales target, for example, of £25,000 for the year, it would mean that we would know roughly how many sales we needed to make per year or per month. In this example, if you had a sales target of £25,000 for the year with an average deal size of £500, you'd have to make 
50 sales in order to make your 25 sales for that year to hit that sales target. So either one sale per week or four sales per month. But as a way to generate an activity um, that will actually generate, so there's a way to create activity that can generate that amount of interest in your business and deals that you should be able to close. Now, typically speaking, um, we would recommend having at least 200 prospects per clients per year at a close rate of about 25%. You tend to close between 20 to 25% of your actual sales pipeline. So it means that in this case here, if you wanted to close £25,000 worth of sales per year, you're more likely to need to generate a pipeline of about £100,000 for that year in order to achieve your sales target. It means that sales is very tough, very demanding, and we'll talk about some of the characteristics that you'll need at the end of the year, at the end of the presentation, be able to achieve that success. Now, when we look at what kind of activity is required, so in order to achieve those goals, typically you'll want to be able to have a team or individuals making at least 20 to 25 calls per day. And those calls are typically based on helping you to secure meetings that you can then nurture using the consultative sales approach that we'll also discuss in this presentation as well. And bear in mind, look guys, I invite you to all ask any questions that you have. Please use the tools available within this webinar to ask your questions that I may be able to address during the end of the presentation. Now, what really should be true is that closing a sale, it should be, and it is, the easiest part of the entire sales process. If you conduct a consultative sales approach in the, first, in the earlier part of the actual um, sales process itself. Now, the, we've, I've found over the, my many years of winning business that the consultative sales approach is the most effective way of winning business. Because what it does is it builds great relationships between the both buyer and a supplier. And it doesn't necessarily involve a direct pitch. It involves asking really good questions and continuously asking questions until the client ultimately tells you exactly what it is that they want to buy, as opposed to you as a selling salesperson telling them what you're selling. So the consultative sales approach really involves asking really good open-ended questions. So for example, a great question is asking someone, how do you mean? And when you ask a prospect in that room or over a phone call, how do you mean, or can you explain that again, as opposed to do you mean this or do you mean that, which requires just a yes or no answer. By asking the open-ended question of how do you mean, you get the individual in the room or the individuals in the room to really share and expand upon exactly what it is that they're saying and what they mean and what their problems are. Then it becomes your role to perform an active listening skill, to leverage your active listening or to listen actively. You're listening for pain points. You're going to be listening out for clues around what it is that that individual is actually looking to buy. So the consultative sales approach involves asking more questions around what it is that someone's experiencing, what their problems are, what it means to solve their problems, who's impacted when you solve those problems, and how best would it affect their outcomes and their promotional aspects if you were to able to solve those problems for them. So think about yourselves and your own sales approach in the past. What have you done? What has been your sales approach? And why have you not maybe been able to go past some of these sales opportunities that you had? Is it because you've asked different questions, more closed questions? Have you perhaps moved to selling too quickly? When you think about your own sales approach and why maybe some prospects don't move past the initial call, um, opening call or cold call, is it because you haven't been consultative and just asked an open-ended question? So definitely sit with your team and try to devise a list of consultative questions that you can ask that would really help you understand a bit more around what the client or prospect is, uh, is looking to buy, what pain points are they experiencing? So this is the main side of the presentation today, really, to help you understand how to generate new opportunities. Now, yes, it's possible to code call, it's possible to do emails, et cetera. But what we found, or email blast emails, should I say, but what we found to be the most effective way to generate new sales opportunities is to get an audience to listen to what you have to say through subject matter experts. Typically, what I will do monthly, or sometimes once every two months, is host and then chair a monthly webinar over, I use Zoom personally. So you, whatever tools you use, whether it be Teams 
or, um, or you know, other um, webinar type based tools, use those tools to reach out to your audience of prospects and invite them to sit in and participate in those webinars. Now, be very careful to observe the GDPR regulations and you're not spamming individuals to join your calls, but ultimately host and chair a monthly webinar. Now, bear in mind this very, very critical point. For the most part, your prospects will think that you're gonna be selling to them. They won't want to listen to you if they think you're gonna be selling. So invite a, an industry expert, a subject matter expert, who can sit on a panel or you can have a conversation with and ask questions to that will really help them understand a problem that may exist within the industry that you are related to or sell to. What this does when you begin to advertise and market that, there's an, that there is a webinar being held, and I typically recommend that you do this, begin to market between three and maximum four weeks in advance of the actual webinar, ultimately because if you do it in six weeks or beyond, People will say, well, it's too far out. Not sure what my calendar is, will look like in six weeks' time. They will forget about you. They won't have a recency bias. And therefore, they, you will, your attendance will be, will be low. And statistically, you tend to get between 30 to 50% attendance of those who register for your webinars. So host and chair a webinar and invite your prospects to attend that webinar. But in your marketing, you want to ensure you have a subject matter expert or a panel of experts who can speak on a subject that uh, that will be that will impact those um, who attend their outcomes? So, um, for many people today, there's a lot of focus on ESG. It could be a software-related um, um, uh, or coding um, service that you provide. Find an, a subject that is relevant to your supply to your buyers that will entice them to participate and sit in on a conversation that you will have with your expert or panel, okay? Your, those guests who attend will want to listen to what the individual that you invite has to say. So that individual should be someone who of maybe, uh, uh, you know, some level of seniority or some level of expertise in, um, in that subject that your audience will want to listen to. The great news is those who then register for that subject have now given you their details that you can now reach out to thereafter, okay? So we move down to bullet number five on this list. Once you've conducted your webinar session and you've invited people to ask questions in that webinar, you're then able to then perform what's next like, is the follow-up call to those warm audience, those warm, that warm audience. You will have a number of people who attended the webinar and those who did not attend the webinar, but they still gave you their details. You want to prioritize those who attended the webinar and with a call, with an email or a call, ideally a call, first of all, that says, ultimately, you recently attended our webinar on X subject. Would you be the right person to speak to and have a discussion about that? What you find is the recipient of that call will be more likely to have a conversation with you and book in the conversation because they attended the webinar. And you can position that follow-up call as a capturing of feedback to get your ideas around what the, their ideas around what they felt about the actual um, discussion itself, or to help you understand more about how what kind of events you should be putting on in the future. But that's your opportunity to ask them. So why did you attend that the webinar? What is it about your business today that's um, focusing on that, the subject matter of that webinar? And is it something they are focused on right now in solving in the next couple of months, or is it next year? By asking these questions, you get the ability to understand a bit more about what that business is doing and create a conversation between you, the buyer, and um, between the buyer and you, the supplier. In addition to that, you then can also follow up with an email as well. And the email is, is very worded, very similar to that. Hi, Sarah Jane, you recently attended a webinar or you registered for a webinar but did not attend on subject matter, blah, blah, blah. Um, we'd like to follow up with you. Are you the right person to speak to? Now, that's very soft. It's very warm. There's no sales in that approach. But ultimately, you will find you'll get people responding to you that will then allow you to create a conversation with those individuals. And as you continue to do so, you go through then bullet six. When you schedule your discovery call with that individual, again, you leverage that, that uh, subject, that um, consultative sales approach that will help you really understand what that business is about, what they're focusing on, what their pain points are, and ultimately why that subject uh, that they attended 
was relevant to their business. So the BA, for when you get to the BAU state um, point in this process, you're then able to then schedule normal touch points with those prospects because they've already given you license to reach out to them and give them the information to understand a bit more about what their problems are and what the challenges are and how and what time frame they're looking to solve those particular problems. Now, I do invite you to write any questions you might have on what I've mentioned here before I kind of skip through to the rest of the presentation. So anything I've said so far, please feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A tool at the bottom of your Zoom um, um, panel. Now, the consultative sales approach is really powerful because like I say, what it does, it helps you ask the right questions. But critically, and um, we have to understand some of the times about why we lose deals as well. Often, we don't ask enough questions. We don't understand what the client is really going through. And we're so busy to pitch how good we are at business and how good our solutions are. Or often, to the worst and to our detriment, we make assumptions and we treat every sale opportunity as exactly the same. But ultimately, every business buys differently and every individual will buy differently. And you've got to be able to build a relationship between yourselves and that, and that prospect by asking them really good questions. And then finally, a lot of the times we try to rush the sales process. When we go back to the beginning of this presentation, we talked about sales targets. Now, I actually had a quarterly sales target, not just an annual one. So there will sometimes be some time pressure when trying to actually sell um, and close a deal too soon in order to hit the sales targets that we were set. That Nothing worse could be nothing could be worse for your business if you try to close a deal too soon. Now I'm going to be talking about an anxiety um, close shortly. But so first of all, we don't ask enough questions. We seem to think we understand the client because we've heard it all before. But in actual fact, although client A, B, and C may have the exact same problems, in actual fact, your benefit to being consultative is that you get them to express how they feel. So even if you feel you're repeating yourself to you, their experience with you will be their first time. So you really must continue to go through that process despite it being a little bit, um, you know, a bit frustrating for yourself to kind of be repeating the process. The idea is that you're giving your prospect and uh, the opportunity to experience you, your business's culture and helping them understand what you're about. And by the, the more you spend time with them, the more you ask them questions, the more you'll find that you'll be successful in being able to close the deal because you already know what they want because they've told you through your consultative sales approach. The making of assumptions is when we tend to think that we know what they want because we've already spoken to so many prospects before over the last two, three, four years who all have the same problem. And when we rush that sales process, it becomes extremely frustrating because we're trying to get them to close quickly so we can hit targets. Remove that process and that... that um, that, uh, that frustration and stress from you by trying to rush that sales process. Ultimately, you wanna take control of the sales process itself, but you don't wanna rush it if you haven't asked enough questions. Now, there are some bits of body language actually that are quite interesting to understand. And this is really interesting as well, even when going for an interview. It's called the anxiety close, okay? The anxiety close is made up of a process around understanding, is there anything that we've gone through today that you don't understand, that but if, I, if, I, that if I leave the room in you know, the next 10 minutes, you may not have, those questions may still be unanswered. The anxiety close gives the individual the chance to think about what is it I don't understand about what's just been discussed. And before the individual, the person giving the presentation leaves the room or the Zoom call ends, what is it, that I need to understand so I can help to make an informed decision. So when you ask the same the question, the open-ended question, is there anything that I've asked or gone through today that you don't understand or that is unclear that you'd like me to re review? Can we go over it right now and give you an opportunity to answer those questions? And you'll be surprised just how many questions there are that exist that have not yet um, been asked by someone in that room. There's always someone sat in those presentation rooms who has a question, but is maybe afraid to ask. So you must be able to read the room, read someone who's making notes and pay attention to everyone in that room. So you can actually begin to have, maybe say, you know, Michael Jones, you look like you have a question there. Is there anything that you need me to, you need me to understand or need me to, to address? Um, 
pricing as well. Let's go into pricing very briefly. Often in these conversations, you might find that uh, your pri- that people may ask you questions around pricing. It's important to not negotiate against yourself. And when having discussions around price, that you recognize that pricing is your friend. So think about when people discuss pricing with you, try not to give the price of your product too soon until they've actually seen what it is that you're offering or had a chance to feel in their hands what solution you're offering or what product you're in. This is because people don't tend to understand. They're not able to associate value with price. But that, what I mean is, if you're trying to buy a car and someone says, well, this car is a million dollars or a million, a hundred thousand pounds, sorry. But actually they've not, you've not been able to see the car. You've not been able to sit in the car. You don't understand that the car has automatic massage and can teleport you from the supermarket um, to back to home within 10 seconds. A hundred thousand pounds sounds like a lot. But the moment that you understand the value of the vehicle and what it can do for you, suddenly that price doesn't become too expensive. So try to avoid giving pricing on your products too soon because pricing will, unless they've seen your product, it may be a deterrent for you. So <clears throat> we talked about the anxiety clothes and I just want to kind of go over that again very briefly. The anxiety clothes allows you to read the body language of those who are in the room. And you answer the questions around, is there anything that they've not been processed or not answered yet? Really do pay attention as well to when you're having these discussions following the webinar that they've, they've attended, the discovery call that you've um, scheduled, that when you finally get those individuals on the call, that you only often get one chance to make that impression and to ask the right questions. And as you wrap up your meetings, asking them to pay, you want to pay attention to how the conversation goes um, and any questions that there may be in that room. So again, is there anything that we've gone through today that you don't understand or anything that you're of the, pro- of the, of the, the system that you want to go through that you don't understand or the product that we're servicing, that we sell, that you would like to know more about that you haven't asked yet? Because when you leave that room, those questions go unanswered and therefore unasked and therefore unanswered. So just to recap the process around generating new opportunities for your business. First of all, you want to host and chair a monthly or bi-monthly webinar where you invite your prospects through your marketing capability to attend and sit in on these, on these webinar sessions. The topic should be industry related, so related to what you sell, but without you selling your product, it's industry related, something that they will be focused on or interested in. Invite a subject matter expert or a panel of experts who you interview and you can get them to talk about the industry or why solving this problem is a problem or ultimately um, help them to express some of the issues that they've had and that will be, be able to relate, that will be relatable to your, uh, your audience. You then want to follow up uh, maybe within two days or three days, you want to follow up um, with a warm call to say, hey, Sarah Jane, um, thank you for attending our recent webinar. Um, can we, uh, you know, are you the right person to speak to? And is this something that, that we can discuss further? When you discuss, when, then you then get to schedule that discovery call. And the tip to get in the discovery call is ask the question um, and give them a time frame that works for you. So is there any time in the next two weeks or this week or next week that works best for you? The reason why you want to be specific about scheduling a discovery call with a set time frame is because ultimately, uh, if you leave it open, they the individual may then think that they have no availability and they can't because there's nothing to focus on. But if you give them a time frame of the next two weeks or the next 10 days, they then can say, right, I've got a small window to look into. Let me look when I'm available for the next 10 days. And at that, that point, they'll be able to say, right, we can do four o'clock on a Wednesday on this particular date. So make sure that you do that part as well, that you schedule the discovery call and you give them a window that you think that is reasonable for them to find time for you. And as you continue your BAU or the business as usual, and you maintain your relationships through scheduled touch points, again, be consultative in your approach. 
ask questions around any more challenges that they've come across when they spoke internally about your meeting about your meeting that you had the discovery meeting that you had would did any other questions come up or what questions came up that require further conversation and so in doing so you're really able to generate um these new opportunities that ultimately as you begin to go through your sales process uh, will be able to close more successfully because you've been consultative in your approach now, one of the other ways to actually generate new opportunities as well is to get access to a various number of tender uh, platforms. Now, a tender is where a business says we actually have a budget and we have a, um, a an opportunity to buy a brand new product or service with these sets of requirements. Now, Clara is a tender management platform as well. I'm going to very briefly show you how to do a search in Collider for opportunities that does also exist in other, that may exist in other systems as well. So I'm going to switch over to the Collider platform and I'm going to log into the platform and show you very briefly how to do a search in a platform like Collider. And there are other platforms out there as well where you're able to do a search for opportunities. In the Collider platform, we're going to do a quick filter by turning on opportunities, like we're going to see that we're going to turn on new tenders into the central screen. We're then going to say, show us all opportunities by filter that are related to, I'll do two sectors, to uh, IT services, we'll choose. And hopefully some of you here are within the IT sector. And we'll do, we'll do uh, software packages as well. And we click on save. And in these tender platforms and portals that exist out there, so do a search to find what's best for your industry, you're able to then click on search. And what Collider does in this instance is it will now turn on and show in the middle of the screen opportunities where buyers are trying to find these um, software related services across the UK and in this case there's seven European countries. So you find opportunities in here, for example, at like the University of Exeter, who are actually have 150,000 pounds and they're looking for someone who can help to develop software packages that you could apply for. So there are, there are organizations and tender platforms like Collider that you can use uh, to help you find uh, opportunities. So as we go back to just kind of wrapping up and closing um, the presentation today, uh, and I've actually done it within 25 minutes, which is great. So hopefully there's lots of questions you might want to ask. Um, remember, don't negotiate yourself, avoid, avoid um, and, and, and really do leverage the anxiety close by reading body language and trying to find ways to answer the ask the question, Right, if there's anything else in the room that's not been addressed first before. And I wanted to touch very briefly on this part because look, I, I've been in sales for a long time and I know just how tough it is. Um, I've been at home kind of, you know, my wife's had to kind of almost console me because the day's not gone well or I've been told no 25, 30, 40 times. It is demoralizing. For you to be successful in sales, you need to have tenacity, persistence, and perseverance. And if you are hiring sales individuals, these are some of the attributes you really want to be looking for because it will help you, it will help those are the individuals who are able to overcome the negativity that if you are making those 25 to 50 calls per uh, per year, you know, between, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say like 6,000 calls per year and you're being told no 80% of the time, it's a lot of uh, rejection. You need tenacity and persistence and perseverance to be able to the following day brush off the yesterday's nose and come back in again and actually hit the phones and they'll make those phone calls that will help you be successful also these skills will help you to develop your resilience because you'll know that a no is not personal it's just not the right time and one of the key things here really is i want to talk about very briefly is make sure you sell an experience not a product by able to by being able to sell an experience and how something will change someone's life and how it will be able to make an impact on them, you end up not necessarily pitching your product itself, but in actual fact, certainly the outcomes that the individual themselves will receive. So that really kind of brings to a close the presentation today on how to generate opportunities. It looks as though there's a number of questions which have been posted into the platform. I'm really pleased to have these questions. Um, I don't think there's anything more to me, for me to really re-go over again. But I'm very well happy to have these questions on uh, to be read out to me now to address those. And I think I'll stop sharing the screen at this time as well. So thank you for listening. And let's go through to the questions. 
Okie dokie, Jason. Right. So as you say, yes, we've been absolutely inundated with questions today. Thank you so <laughs> much um, for delivering that, Jason. And thank you so much for so many wonderful questions. Um, yeah, as you say, we haven't got that much time for all of these questions, even though we finished <laughs> earlier. There's just so many. But let's Very just good. start now. Um, the first one we've got is, should I aim for larger contracts or remain in my current niche of um, SME slash micro business and residential energy savings? Great question. Um, what you want to be very careful of is not having contracts that impact your business if you lose those that business. So for example, if a contract is hypothetically 60% of your revenue for your business, you're at risk that if that big business left you, you're only now 40% of your revenue, which could impact the outcomes of your business. So try to find a balance where if one client left, it's not a problem to impact your survival. However, definitely go for opportunities that can help to grow your business. If that's, hopefully that answers your question. Right, okie dokie. The second one we've got here, um, we've had quite a few overlapping questions. So with those, I'll try and also condense them as well. Um, okay. The second one we've got is there's a thin line between spam and cold outreach. Um, and that's an, is an issue that this business struggles with. How do you stay on the right side of this line? Add value, always add value. It could be a three point bullet check email of, three things that X sector is looking for today, or here are a list of five items that might be valuable. You know, leverage leverage um, LinkedIn. I haven't really talked about LinkedIn as well. Leverage a social media platform as not to support or condone any one particular platform. Use a platform where you can talk about your subjects, right? That people, when you connect to you, they can see what you're thinking, what you're, what you're, what's going through your mind and leave your emails to add real value that will add value in the inbox. So I've started writing content around five things that impact blah, 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 blah. And what you find is, although it's drip feeding bits of information, it's not necessarily spammy, but it's actually got value that it adds. So I guess the answer to the question is add value as opposed to keep marketing yourself. Often we use, um, we use email as well to market ourselves. The truth is people don't want to be marketed to. They don't want to be sold to. But if you can give them free value, if you can help change their lives for free, if they can get something off you for free, you find that they actually do end up um, responding really well to your content. They don't put you on their spam list um, because they think that whenever they get an email from, again, we use Sarah Jane, Sarah Jane's emails add value. Also get a real balance of how often you email. I tend to email through my platform maybe three times a month because it leaves seven to 10 days in between content. And I see a reduction. I see an increase in ownership, in open, in readership. So the open rate of emails. And I see an increase in the click rate of emails. So leverage your own websites to post your blogs where you can kind of post content you want to talk about. Um, I tend to email seven to 10, every seven to 10 days, because I think that's what rate I'm seeing the increase in, um, uh, in, in in readership and I see an increase in the click rate as well so if you can use a tool that will give you access to the data that will show your performance okay I'm actually going to push a bit more on that because the next question that we've got is around the content of of those cold emails um, is it a case that less is more or how do you get someone to respond in those emails I like the question, are you the right person to speak to about this? It's really, really soft. You know, it, it's not pushy, you know, and I wouldn't overdo the introduction, you know. Um, and like I said, the, the key thing here is offer value. Sarah Jane, we'd like to invite you to a webinar where we're going to be talking about industry, subject, industry matter, and we've invited subject matter expert to attend. So by doing so, the whole purpose of any outreach is really to gain access to the individual, right? And so when you're, when you're adding that level of value, I believe it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that people then participate and engage with you. And therefore, then the warm emails and the warm cold calls thereafter are ult ultimately welcome because you've added value. I can't stress adding value enough. Thank you. Right, just moving over to our next question now. I've been using surveys to capture feedback from my customers 
to help shape my sales process. Would you recommend this or think it's better to do the webinar that you suggested? Um, the thing about sales is that um, you've got to be a chameleon. There's not any one solution that works for everyone. So you've got to do a multitude of things. I would do code calling, right? I would do warm calls. I'll do blast emails and I'll do webinars and I'll do LinkedIn and I'll do Facebook and I'll do Twitter. You've got to do everything you can. And ultimately, you then want to be able to follow up with everyone as best as you can. Surveys are a great way to cap capture information. But the question is what you do next once you've, once you've captured that data from the survey. So if you're producing surveys, good. Are you sharing the results of that survey or are you just asking someone for more information again? If that's the case, you're not actually adding any value. You're taking and businesses do really well. Sorry, I put another way. Prospects perform better with you and engage better with you when they feel they're getting something back from you. So if your survey is purely for your own benefit as a business, um, they're unlikely to be, they may answer one survey. Will they answer three? No, because you've offered them no value back in return. Okay, um, moving on to the next question. Now, we've got quite a few, actually, specifically um, around Collider, um, okay. which I'm hoping you'll be able to answer in, in one go. Um, the first one is um, about Collider. I'm interested in Collider. Are there opportunities for a van conversion and van racking company? Um, the other one is just specific information around Collider. Um, how is it different to other platforms in the market? Um, so, um, yeah, if you could just tell us a bit about Collider and what it can actually offer. Okay, so very briefly, and guys, I, yeah, thank you for the questions on that as well. Essentially, my experience in sales, I came from a background where I was making 50 phone calls a day, about 12,500 phone calls per year. And often you miss opportunity, you miss access to those opportunities because you call too late or um, the, the RFP tender platform is already full, you can't get access to the opportunity. Um, so ultimately, the platform has been designed to hopefully to alert you when there's an opportunity in the marketplace that you may not have been aware of. On the other side, it's designed to help um, the buyers themselves find, identify, and assess businesses that they may want to participate in with in the tender process. For the most part, um, businesses are trying to find innovation and service providers that will differentiate a, their customer's experience, but also be different from uh, their existing supply chain. So Collider, as a business, we focus on helping the buyers find organizations that they can invite to participate in tenders. There is a special lens on Collider, which is supply diversity, which are SMEs and also businesses owned and operated by women, businesses owned by um, those who are LGBTQ+, veterans, um, ethnic minorities, um, those who are LGBTQ+, and neurodivergent. A lot of corporates today who are focusing on ESG want to work with more diverse owned businesses. But critically to, I must say, we are fully inclusive. We don't exclude anyone from joining the platform because our buyers want to just find the most competitive price, the best innovation from those who can deliver their services and requirements. So that's in a nutshell what the Cloud Platform is. Um, and I appreciate the question. Thank you. Right. Um, now, we've also had quite a few questions come in about... Um, public sector um, procurement. Um, and I've just summarized it into one. If you could just share maybe three top tips for a small business trying to win um, a public sector um, tender with a council. Um, it's very hard, right? Because it, the, a tender process takes a lot of time and effort from your business. If you're able to, you might want to try to outsource some of those processes around addressing, answering the questions on the tenders. Um, tenders can be sometimes 20, 30, questions long and it takes so long for you to put together a really strong proposition and um, that's both public and it's private sector it's, it's you know so, so so bear that in mind um the top tips really are don't take on more than you can chew uh when you get access to the tender document assess it whether or not you have a real good opportunity to win what they're asking for before you begin to fill out the questions and begin to sub, um, submit your responses Look at the requirements and understand, that, is it something that you really can deliver on? Or is there an opportunity for you to create a mini consortium and have maybe two or so companies go yourself and another partner company go for that tender where you can then deliver closer to 100% of the requirements. But whilst, whilst there are opportunities out there that are 
look, the big numbers are great. It's very attractive to say, oh, there's an opportunity here for a million pound or five million pound. The truth is, as per the first question that the individual asked, if you won that deal, would it impact the outcome of your business? Or is it better to go for a deal worth 50 grand where it keeps the lights on for another two years, but actually helps you grow incrementally? So those are probably the top tips. Don't bite off more than you can chew. We all have ambition to win that big one. But ideally, if you can, find a company that you can partner with, big or small. And maybe if you if you partner with a big company, for example, they might be able to get 80% of the revenue, you get 20% of the revenue, and in that way, you can grow your business incrementally as well. But be careful not to take on too much because it can be to the detriment of your business as well. Thank you. Right, the next question. Um, any tips on how a solopreneur can balance sales and delivery? Well, that's a really good question. Mm. Um, the tr the, look, the truth is there is no easy way, right? I, I wish I wish I could color, um, what they call this? Um, um, we say when you kind of cut some sugar coat it, there you go. <laughs> I wish I could sugar coat it, there, you, there, you can't. It just takes hard work. There's no, there's no, there's no quick solution outside of hard work and dedication. And it, it is difficult. We all want to make sure we get our, our mental health and our mental well-being balanced, right? It's very important to understand that we shouldn't do anything that is to our physical or mental detriment, but it requires hard work. Um, what, one top tip maybe is if you were in a particular line of work or a business or an employment before you started as you're on your solo journey, Reach out to those people that you spoke to before, those employees, employers you worked for before, and see if you can build relationships there that maybe you can sell your services to. Basically, try not to go broad and narrow. Go, or what's it? Go, don't go wide and narrow. Go shallow and go deep. So go to those people who you know um, from your industry, if your business is in the same industry, and try to sell to those individuals who already know you, who you already have credibility with, those are quick wins when you can build those relationships there. Probably the best thing I can, I can offer you on that question today, but a great question. Uh, we've got another great question as well here, actually, Jason. Um, obviously, okay. with, with the pandemic, we've seen lots of businesses shift virtually. Um, so the next question is, um, how do your tips differ for an e-commerce business um, where their business is virtual? Um, they've said, I'm selling online toolkits, so I'm finding it hard to build relationships with clients. Have you got any advice that you can share, Jason? Sorry, so late, the last part, find it hard to build relationships with clients. Yeah, um, they're an online business selling toolkits, yeah. finding it hard to build relationships with clients online. And they're just Give away, to Yeah, it. you've got to have free giveaways, right? Give it, basically, have free giveaways that you can, do, then, that you can then upsell. Remember, this is <laughs> really weird. People want freeness. They want to be given something for free. I, I struggle with that myself as well in my business. But where you can give away something for free, what you hope for is that free thing that you produce that hasn't that can be produced once and given away for free lots of times. For example, um, a, a top ten a, a top ten tip on how to do X Y Z. You create it once, you can give it away for free loads of times, right? So join our web, join our mailing list and receive our top 10 tips on X, Y, Z. When you give something away for free, you build credibility. You also get the ability to upsell because they give you their details in order to receive the freebie. So if you can afford to give something away for free, that doesn't cost you too much. Um, you hope to then be able to upsell them there, you know, there and uh, thereafter as a result. Hopefully that answers that question. But again, really good question. Right. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, and this is about introducing new products to customers. Um, how do you go about it? So the new product, was it introduced as a result of a client or prospect saying to you, this is what they're after? And if it is, have that client or customer be your advocate and talk about it. OK, so where you if you have something that you delivered and, in, and let's say, for example, client A has asked for it, you've built it and delivered it. Remember, prospects don't want to hear from you. They want to hear from your experts, from those, from people who uh, are in the same industry as them. So have your buyer attend the webinar where they are speaking about the problem that they had and how they actually solved that problem with your solution, right? And what that then does is it gives you credibility and you haven't had to say anything outright yourselves to kind of gain that credibility. So 
that's probably one of the best ways to address that. Use your clients to be your uh, to be your 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 biggest advocates and, and mouthpiece to talk for you on your behalf. In many cases, you might want to ask your client to put out a statement of some sort that they're working with you because again, that gives you more credibility as well. We've done it ourselves within Collider. When we've had new clients join the business, we've gotten them to put out a press statement, often a press release, a LinkedIn statement that says that they have partnered with Collider to do something. So have your clients talk about you and the solution that you provided and how it best it solved their problem for you, uh, for how you solved their problem for them. Thanks for that, Jason. Right, just moving on to the next one. Um, yeah. This is from a startup business, so they're brand yeah. new business, um, and they're asking where is the best place to search for companies that would be of value to their business, contract wise. They're just wondering if you're aware of any directories or anything that they can use to search for business that might benefit them. Oh, really good question. And look, congratulations for starting your business. It's, it's a very, um, very brave of you. It's going to be, you know, if this is your first business, be prepared to work hard, but also that. Um, every no is just a next opportunity. That's what it stands for, okay? So be ready to, to, to knuckle down and expect some difficult, hard times. But in terms of where the best places to go, the truth is um, I never knew, I never understood how to use LinkedIn to the best of its ability because I thought, but, so bear this in mind, LinkedIn as a platform is not a place where you push and sell a product or service there and then. Instead, you build relationships through posting content that adds value. And people then connect to you and reach out to you thereafter as a result. There are great organizations like the FSB who actually put on um, networking events. You uh, attend those networking events where you can not only talk about what you offer, but learn what someone else might be, what someone else might need that you can offer them as well. Sorry, or what they can offer you, sorry. So network in person as much as you can. Maybe set aside maybe four hours a month where you can join various networking boards. And the FSB do a great job of having not just regional ones, but national ones as well. Feel free to join those and network and you'll, you'll find your feet. Um, but again, probably the better advice actually is make sure you're spending your time in the right places. That if you network too much, that means you're not doing the calls that you need to do and the follow-ups you need to do thereafter. So try to spend your time appropriately um, to, to make enough calls where you need to, um, use LinkedIn to, to create to post content that people will, will uh, respond to and find um, business organizations like the FSB that can help put you in front of businesses through networking where you may be able to add value or pitch or not say pitch but learn what others want and showcase what you provide as well. Fantastic. Right. So the next question we've got here is the saying goes people by people. Have you any advice on how to break through the tender process where the tenderer refuses to speak with the supplier and the tender is simply scored on an ability to answer with key words? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, the truth is, though, is these buyers are trying to find the best possible product, right? You might be a great person, but if you can't solve their problems, then they, they, they simply shouldn't and can't buy from you. But in order to get in a room, you've had to be, it does, it is then a people buy from people process, right? So again, not just network, but offer value. I can't extra express enough how many people want to take and they just want to take, but they don't want to give anything themselves. And when, what will differentiate you from everyone else in that room is when you're the person who's giving value for free, because that will help build a re your, your reputation and, your, and the, the fact that the integrity around your business model um, that, that will be appealing to individuals to at least create a relationship with yourselves. And remember, these relationships aren't just at the company where that person is there and then at that day. They can move on to somewhere else tomorrow and then know of you and your service and say, so actual fact, we haven't got a tender process. We have a simple buy-in process and they may be able to buy for you much more easier without the regiment of an actual tender process. So businesses who buy, buy via tenders tends to be very important here. Some companies, there's a cap. Anything under a hundred thousand pound, they don't have to have a tender, okay? Anything over a hundred grand, they have to have a tender process. In some clients, for example, one of our clients is um, John Lewis. They have the tender process that starts after a certain value of tender. I, I think it's 250 grand, I think it is. So there's lots of opportunity where there's not a tender process involved, but there's good revenue to be gained 
if you build relationships with people that add that you add value to i can't stress it more please add value think about what you can offer for free what you can give the advice you can give the answer the questions that these people have that you can solve through a, a, a brief conversation right um and this actually leads into the next question quite nicely um, with all the economic uncertainty, many, many businesses are looking to cut costs and reduce budgets in this environment. How can we adapt our B2B sales approach to increase the chance of conversions? Sure. It's a really good question. Um, you know, the, the com what's common amongst these questions and the answers to them is about value, right? But also, no, bear this in mind, um, sales is a numbers game, Okay. But what I mean is you've got to put in, make all the calls, have all these meetings, give all these presentations, and it's a numbers game. If you're not hitting your targets that we set at the top, right? So let's say 25 calls a day, a, a day that's uh, 125 calls a week, that's 6,000 calls a month, a, a year, sorry. It's possible that you might not hit your target. So you've got to hit those calls and meeting targets first. Those targets actually help you find and filter out the opportunities that are live if you're not if you're making five calls a day you're only making 25 calls a, a week that's 100 calls a month to prospects it simply isn't enough um throughput to be able to actually really generate enough sales on a b2b standpoint so um Samantha, can i get that question again as well i want to make sure i answered it properly can i get it again yeah absolutely yeah um so basically, uh, oh, hang on a second. I'm just trying to go through. <laughs> There's just it. so many questions. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, right. So actually leading to this question, what techniques, approaches do you recommend to get the first foot in the door? It's, it's summarizing. We've had like three or four questions on, on the same thing. Uh, what techniques, approaches do you recommend to get the first foot into the door for lead generation potential clients? Everyone seems to be different and it's always good to get different ideas. So yeah, basically techniques, top tips on, on, on how to, to, you know, to make yeah. that vital impact and get that first foot into the door. Yeah. Bear, just, you know, as to repeat the presentation, they, your prospects don't really care about you. <laughs> they don't care as in, they don't care about your opinions. They care about what the person that you can bring into the room um, has to offer. So if you can get a session going or a conversation going or a webinar going where you can invite the expert into the room, that will be a great way for you to build credibility, right? They, your prospects then see you as the conduit to a brand new powerful relationship. So if you're able to get, for example, the CEO or the, or, you know, the CFO or the CTO or a, a chief something into a room to talk about their experiences with x problem you're seen as a the person to know it's just the way the psychology works and then when you get out in that when you when you achieve that you become the person to speak to as well so align yourselves with senior management um and how do you do that offer them value value is answers to questions for free consultations and you know be, be consultations maybe just addressing a question it could be a small document that you've that you've provided that you've created a leaflet of some sort that you can digitally send out to them and then ultimately when you do that it can it only takes one you know you have one in person that you like or that you you know you invite them to speak on your behalf at the event that you put on that's where your credibility is um is, is gained i think Simone, we've got time maybe for maybe three more questions and i'll try and be quick on them yeah as well so this one actually leads in they're all around the same but they're they're, they're the same but sort of have different variations i use okay. spin um he's, they're saying and it's good it kind of makes the call consultive are there any selling techniques that you would suggest selling techniques um if we talked about the anxiety close uh oh, it's a really good question let me come back to that one quickly. So um, let me come back to that one. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, tell, now... I'll tell you what to do. I'll tell you what to do. Buy, there's a book called The Art of Closing. I can't remember what the guy's name is now, but Google it, The Art of Closing. And that book has got a great way of talking about the different ways of closing different sales um, because everyone's a bit different, okay? Um, but the, the most important way is that before, if you do take the consultative sales approach, you actually shouldn't need to close. Because what happens is you've already built the relationship with the company in the first place where you just become the, the vendor of choice. Remember, 
I guarantee, pretty much almost, that everyone else in that room who's selling, every other prospect is just pushing product, pushing product, pushing product. The moment that you actually ask a question, take a step back, I think your credibility is different. It differentiates you from everyone else. And I think that's really the key to closing business deals because you answered questions. And then you want to showcase how you've listened. Really critical. You said you had this problem. Here's how we would solve this problem. Which one of these problems, so solutions that we've offered, do you think would work best for you? So we sat with the team. You said that X, Y, Z is a problem. Here's what we've offered or we thought about. Solution A, B, or C, right? Then your prospect says to you, actually, we quite like B with a little bit of C. What does that look like? And again, they've told you what the solution, what, how to actually close that business as well. So take their questions back from them. Come back to them and say, I'm going to get back to you in two weeks or 10 days with an answer to your question and then give them a solution to the problem as opposed to everyone else who's always just selling their own products or services. Right. I think we might have time for one or two more. Um, okay. This one is around the size of contract. What size of contracts or businesses should I go after? Oh, without knowing more about your business, I don't know. But yeah. think about, look at it, look at it differently. What is your sales target for the year? What is the cost of running your business for the year? And then look at it. If you won one deal that year and it was big enough, would it impact your business later if you lost it? If everyone focused on that one deal, would they be able to focus on the account management of the existing deals? Sometimes we can get a bit greedy or a bit sort of like, um, you know, desperate to kind of grow our operations. Um, but realistically, sometimes too big a deal can be too big for us as a business. And for the most part, a buyer may discount you if they feel that they are a risk to your business as well. Um, again, not knowing much more about your business, for the most part, from an SME perspective, right through from two people to 250 people, employees, you could be ranging from a £25,000 deal per year up to a multi, you know, to a seven, seven figure deal to the region of you know, two million pound over a three year contract. So I, I really can't answer that question without knowing more about your business. Just think about the impact it would have on your business, not if you won it, but if you lost it uh, after winning it. Right, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna try and slip two in actually here, Jason, because I'm okay. hopefully you might be able to answer them both. We've just been flooded with questions today, which is amazing. <laughs> right, would you recommend sales training? And if so, which type of training? And also if you were hosting a webinar, what are the best people to invite as a speaker? Okay, so sales train, um, sales professionals. Um, the attributes you want are what I mentioned. Someone who is able to not be dismayed by being told no. They've got to be strong-willed in character. They also need to be able to be self-starters, as in pick up the phone and they, and just dial it, smile in and dial in. They call it smile and dial. If someone is able to, um, if someone doesn't like making cold calls, they're not, shouldn't be in sales. Uh, but also bear in mind, an account manager is different to a salesperson, okay? An account manager will take an existing account and say, hi, Sarah Jane, You've been our clients for the last two years. How have you found it? What's going on? What can we do better for you? And they will retain that account. A new business salesperson will say, hi, Sarah Jane, you've never heard of us before. Here's what we do. Can we schedule a conversation? You want to find people who are tenacious, who are persistent, but also have the ability to overcome, sorry, and to be, to be self-motivated. I was, very quickly, I was asked to train people how to make sales calls. I turned, I turned the contract down. I can't teach you to be hungry. If you can find somebody who's hungry, they'll be your best advocates and salespeople you, you have. Last one before we go. Uh, I think that's it now, actually. I don't think we've got time for any more. But thank you okay. so much for joining us today. Some amazing questions. I tried my best to fit them all in. And <laughs> hopefully, you know, Jason managed to answer as many of those topics as possible. Um, a huge thank you, Jason, um, for taking the time and sharing such fantastic insight into sales and procurement today. Um, thank you so much as well for those of you that came along and submitted some amazing questions today. Jason is on LinkedIn. Um, and if you have got any more questions that you'd like to um, ask him, I'd urge you to connect with him on there. Um, something we're really, really proud of at FSB um, is our Trust Pilot page. There are some fantastic testimonies on there. So if you found today's session useful or you've used an FSB benefit and found it really helpful, please do lose, uh, leave us a Trust Pilot review. We really, really appreciate it. So that's all from us. Hopefully we're on the nose. I can see we are. Thank you so much for participating and enjoy the rest of your day.